Welcome everybody, this is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, and we are excited to share with you a program about, about service to others. And you will know if you have seen our programs before, that we have a special interest in innovation, entrepreneurship, and education. And we thought we'd start uh, our program today a little bit differently than we usually do. What I want you to know is uh, that, that our speaker today is in Ontario, Canada, but he's gonna be talking to us about a very specific place in Ontario, called Moose Factory. And if you have never been there, let's, let's show you where that is. So here we go. You can see Ontario there and far Northeast Ontario, and this is Moose Factory itself. And so if you're curious what this, this community looks like, this is what it looks like, all right? And so uh, our speaker is not from there, but he's gonna tell you how he's connected to there. And his name is John Curry. And John is a Rotarian. And like, like lots of Rotarians, he uh, focuses all, all of his, his retired time on making great things happen with, uh, with, with service to others. He's been involved with a program called HIP, which is a wonderful word. And those of you who are my age or maybe a little older know that that's a great word. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're a little young. Anyway, that's okay. Uh, regardless, uh, John is, is a person who was in the IT industry, uh, he, he still does a little bit of consulting, but, but now his big thing is HIP. And I am going to pass it over him, to him so that he can tell you more about not only the organization, but the good that the organization is doing for youth in Canada. John, let me hand it to you. Thank you very much, Rushton, and, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak about something that uh, I'm extremely passionate about. It's about really kind of connecting kids and connecting them with the technologies that exist today. Um, HIP uh, stands for Honoring Indigenous People, and it uh, uh, was started by Rotarians. I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction to it. As we know, this is a Rotarian slide that I use all the time, but um, it, what's important here is that there's 720 Rotary Clubs across Canada, and we have 23,000 members. And Toronto Rotarians were sitting here going, we do this wonderful work all around the world, why aren't we doing something here at home? Uh, the, the challenges that Canada has had with its Indigenous people is, is something that's recent. It's not just the history books. Uh, the last residential school closed in 1996. Uh, the 60s scoop was a, a huge impact. And a lot of this has created intergenerational trauma. And so we have on our reservations uh, clean water problems, education issues. Um, we have, uh, you know, very little in local economies in some of these, these places. Uh, we have parenting skills that uh, need to be restored. And so Rotarians are sitting here going, hey, well, how do we get involved? We have 634 First Nation communities, 720 Rotary Clubs. How do we connect them together? Uh, Rotary can provide all sorts of resources. Before doing anything, Rotarians uh, followed a specific process, which was, let's go and speak to Indigenous people and see how best we can help. I mean, we can sit in a bubble and try to create all these uh, solutions ourselves, but what's really important is to understand how do Indigenous people want to be helped, if at all? Uh, do they want just to be left alone, or is there something specific that we can focus in on? And it came back time and time again uh, for us to focus in on education. And they said, listen, uh, you know, John, we can solve water problems, we can put in a water system, we can, we can put in schools, we can put in a lot of this infrastructure, but if we don't have people trained to be able to support them, then all of those great efforts uh, will, will crumble at the end of the day. So HIP, one of the coolest things that HIP did right from the very beginning was said, listen, let's make a board that's 50% Indigenous and 50% Rotarian, and one day, it's my hope that we'll be 100% Rotarian and 50% Indigenous as, as we're starting to see a trend from places that we're working where some of these Indigenous communities are now becoming Rotarians. The other cool thing about what we've done is uh, we're 50% women and 50% men, so we have a very, very balanced uh, perspective overall. Um, we're coast to coast, so we have board members as far as British Columbia all the way through to New Brunswick. And uh, they're not just anybody that's sitting on the board. These are people who are uh, prominently and well-known in the communities uh, that we're serving. The other thing was, listen, we needed to, to figure out what is our mission, and our mission became three parts. One, promoting awareness. You know, talking about the truths and, and how recent uh, some of the actions that the government had taken that have caused some of this uh, trouble that we 
we experience and, and, and letting people know what that, that truth is. Because over the years, there's been a lot of propaganda. For example, uh, or even just hidden altogether, I grew up in Dryden, Ontario, and it was 50 kilometers away from McIntosh Residential School. McIntosh Residential School was never spoken about. It was where they, they, they took young kids, and it was, there was no roads into it. It was very isolated, and many of those kids didn't survive, and they're buried in unmarked graves. So this is a part of our history, uh, a very black part of a dark part of our history that, uh, you know, nobody has spoken about, but people need to understand uh, and, and, and be aware of. Um, the second part to what we do is building relationships. And that's that where that comes in is connecting those 720 Rotary Clubs uh, to the 634 First Nation communities. As we know, Rotarians are wonderful people and they come from all walks of life. We are lawyers, uh, accountants, uh, educators, just business owners. And these are all resources that uh, Indigenous people can tap into uh, as, as things are beginning to change and as education starts to uh, move forward. Supporting education is our last component, but we support education in as it's requested by Indigenous people themselves. We're not just Rotary. We have uh, lots of organizations like Siemens and, and, and Indigenous organizations and uh, all sorts of other groups who are all part of what we do. Um, so although Rotary is our primary engine, uh, we have uh, resources from, from all walks of life. Uh, Siemens has become a really wonderful partner in, in supporting education. Um, over the last few years, they've actually donated over a half a million dollars worth of technology and uh, let me just kind of back up and explain how that's all come about. Siemens recognized very early on that, you know, they replace their laptops every two and a half years. And the laptops that they buy are, are really fantastic laptops to begin with. So they have a lot of life cycle still on them. And they said, hey, why don't we put these in the hands of people that need them because they're still good, uh, still solid laptops. And in fact, uh, many times, uh, above the, the the basic laptop that you buy at, at Best Buy or some of the other stores. And uh, so they didn't just say, let's donate them. They said, let's make this into an employee engagement event and where they wipe the laptops and then they bring their employees and their families down and they do a, a quality assurance type of check on these laptops. Uh, at the same time, it allows us to be able to bring in an indigenous elder or indigenous chief to actually give a talk on uh, indigenous culture and, and indigenous challenges that, that are faced. So that's one of our big programs that we do. And we get the laptops in the hands of not only the schools, but also the, uh, the kids who are going off to university or post-secondary education. We do a number of other things, welcome boxes, education, wellness, uh, book program, and bursaries. Uh, but for the purposes of this conversation, I really wanna focus in on our technology uh, front. Operation Friend it is a student-to-student -student engagement, and it made a lot of sense. So we just launched the pilot, and this is where Moose Factory comes in. The student-to-student -student engagement, uh, it, you know, we were thinking about how do we connect students. The challenge that we had, the challenge that was brought to our attention was the fact that a lot of kids in these remote communities, they're isolated, and there's no roads into them. They're flying communities, and they have limited access and you know access to resources to help them with studying to do homework and, and and other learning opportunities and so when the chiefs were asking me they said john how do we get our kids help because a lot of the parents haven't graduated high school themselves and there's a they struggle and they want to do wonderful things for the kids but they just don't have the capability to do it i was looking at my own kids and I, I saw how they studied. In the old days, uh, it goes back a little while, uh, we used to go to a library and we used to have study sessions. And today, my kids were actually doing the study session via online tools. They would use Skype or FaceTime and they'd have all their friends there uh, on, on, on the screen to work together. So why not do something similar here? Uh, why don't we help try to connect some of the Northern uh, communities, the Northern kids, the students, with some of the uh, students who have lots of resources within the, uh, the urban setting. And uh, before we just dived into it, we had to figure out a way also to be able to form friendships, to build those relationships 
to be able to make it something that would be sustainable. Now, Moose Factory is very uh, unique, and it was picked as a, for our pilot project for a very specific reason. In Canada, they're going to be one of the first to actually get a drone delivery. Um, Moose Cree uh, First Nation is actually a distance away from Moose Factory, and there is no roads there. In the wintertime, they sometimes have an ice road, but depending on weather and, and conditions, uh, the ice road uh, can be hit and miss. The kids from Moose Cree, it's a really cool thing. They get a chance to go to school every day by helicopter. And so they're flowing into Moose Factory. The drone technology is going to be able to deliver really uh, needed medical supplies, food, uh, mail, uh, some important elements. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen these drones, but they, this, they, they get fairly large. This is the smallest drone that they have, and it can carry a number of different boxes inside it. The larger ones are as large as helicopters. And, uh, you know, it's great to be able to have the technology there, but what they have to also do is inspire the youth to get involved, to be able to operate these and to be able to maintain them as they go forward. And so STEM technology is, is something that the community was looking to inspire kids to get involved in. Sometimes it's always when opportunity uh, comes, comes available, it's, you know, we take advantage of some of these opportunities. These kids here are from Toronto. They're involved in the first robotics uh, competitions. And in fact, these kids are really fantastic. They, they had the opportunity to almost, uh, they almost got the opportunity to go to the world national, world championships and, uh, and, and lost out at the very last uh, competition. But regardless, these kids are, are top notch when it came to robotics. And they said, listen, Mr. Curry, uh, we're looking for an opportunity to share what we've learned in robotics with indigenous, with indigenous students. They, they're, all these kids get good grades, they make a great, uh, it makes a great partnership with the Moose Factory kids. And uh, what we did was, before we even uh, decided to bring them up there, we wanted to make sure that they had some sort of cultural sensitivity, cultural awareness training put in place. And we brought in elders and we brought in other resources to be able to bring these kids in Toronto up to speed with uh, what they needed to know uh, about the culture up there, what they needed to know about uh, the, the conditions and the, the, the true history of Canada and its relationship with Indigenous people uh, before they ever step foot in the actual community up north. But these kids are superstars and, and they did everything that was, ever, that was asked of them right from the very beginning. This is both kids, groups of kids together. Um, when they got together, it was quiet for about 15 minutes, uh, but they hit it off very quickly. And uh, one, one thing that was really important was that it wasn't one-sided. In order to build relationship, we wanted to make sure that it was balanced. And so the Toronto kids were exchanging their robotics knowledge with the Indigenous kids who then uh, taught land-based training and, and Cree culture to the Toronto kids. And so there was this exchange of knowledge that went on between the two kids. What was really impressive as we were going through this process was that the kids themselves were the ones teaching each other. The teachers up there were extremely grateful because they do have some really wonderful multimedia equipment. They've never seen these robotics before, but they do have some technology available, but the challenge always is, is that they have no teachers in that area. They're actually, the school itself was short three teachers. Uh, it's so isolated. It's so uh, expensive to live there. If you went to a store, for example, the price of produce is about three, two times, three times more expensive than here in Toronto. Um, very limited resources. These are not uh, paved roads. Um, there's not a lot of stores. There's probably the only the two stores, which is the Northern store and then a smaller convenience store. Um, most of uh, the, the conditions are, are very difficult uh, to adjust to if you're not used to uh, being in an isolated North. Uh, for the, but for the people who live there, this is their life, this is their community. And they do have community activities. For example, in the fall, they all go out and they, they do the moose hunt. Uh, they, they do the goose hunts, and uh, they all help provide for each other. 
So for them, it's a beautiful place to live. I really enjoyed it. It was a chance to get up on James Bay, a very gorgeous place to visit uh, and, uh, and to get to know the people, really wonderful people. The kids were teaching each other. And what I, what's really impressive was these indigenous kids, students, um, they didn't have a notebook in front of them. And they listened. They would listen for an hour and a half, two hours, as it was, all the information's being taught to them. And then when it came to do the work, they just dove in and did it. Their ability to retain knowledge is absolutely incredible. And they've never built a robot before. They never programmed a robot before. But just by listening uh, while the, the other kids were, were providing that, those lectures, uh, they were easily able to program and build these robots in record time. It was, it was absolutely amazing to see. Just as a little background, the Indigenous uh, students is one of the, the fastest growing workforces. Uh, they come from a long line of engineers uh, building the canoes, building structures. And when given a chance, uh, they certainly uh, applying their knowledge and their skills to modern things like the technology and the robots are easily able to soak up uh, this type of uh, skills. Here's just a, one of the kits they were, they were putting together. And uh, I, it really was great to see the two groups of kids coming together over a common interest in technology. On the, on the reverse side, the Toronto students spent a lot of time uh, learning about the Cree culture, uh, experiencing things uh, like uh, eating the, uh, the, the, the local foods. Uh, they would have cooked cook goose over a roasted over a fire, roasted over a fire. Um, and they would spend time outdoors, uh, time on the water. Uh, they would, uh, they would, uh, uh, just, just anything that, whether it was language, whether it was words, uh, they just soaked up all of that type of uh, knowledge as well and got a real good experience for what it is like to live in the North. What's it like, uh, for the, the, uh, the Cree students themselves. So here's just a picture of, uh, of the group that went up, uh, really wonderful, fantastic kids. When they came back to Toronto, uh, we connected the two groups of kids using technology again. We utilized uh, Google for nonprofits, fantastic uh, tools. I think most of you are probably aware of them, but I'll just mention that there, there's the, the Drive, which is the document sharing, there's chat, there's video conference, all of these tools to be able to keep the two groups connected. Now, we're just at the beginning stages of connecting these kids, but we are seeing a good user adoption. We're seeing uh, energy being put into actually the kids wanting to stay connected. In the tool, we'll actually have other, we actually have other resources as well, including financial literacy up in the, where their Goose Cree is. Uh, banking is not, uh, is not, a, uh, not really uh, relevant. But when you come down to Toronto, when you start going to school, learning how to use a banking system is, is really going to be critical to their success. You got to keep in mind that some of these isolated communities, they don't even have a high school. And kids as young as 13 years old are actually being flown to places like Thunder Bay and, and uh, Timmins to actually go to high school. And uh, so they're being brought away from home. They have very little funds a lot of the time. And so we try to help them by filling the gaps and connecting the local Rotary Club with them who will hold pizza parties for them and, and uh, help be a resource to kind of their community outside of their community overall. In December, we will be bringing the 10 Indigenous students to Toronto to continue the relationship building and also for them to have a friendly robotics competition as a team together. The, there will be a number of other activities here to continue the uh, robotics and the STEM type of knowledge and, and exchange. Uh, but, it, you know, it's, it's just important that, that they continue to build, have opportunities to build that relationship. The two schools, in fact, uh, both the, uh, the Moose Cree School and the, uh, the Toronto School, uh, want to make this a, a, a yearly uh, activity. And, uh, and so that other kids, as, as they're coming through in grade 10, get this opportunity to, to, to uh, reach out and be a, a partner with each other, uh, you know, provide those, those uh, relationship building and, and the opportunity to, uh, to connect together. 
So that, that's kind of the end of the, the initial presentation, Rushton. Is there anybody that has any questions for me? Absolutely. We, we, we definitely want to talk about this. Uh, before, we, before we get into that part, I do want to do some introductions as well. Um, so in addition to, to John, uh, we have with us from Houston, uh, home, of the, home of the Astros, uh, fighting it out in, in the, uh, the World Series at the moment. And by the time you see this recording, you'll know the outcome at any rate. Uh, so, Rory, you know, give, give a wave to the uh, camera, Judge, Judge Rory Olson uh, and mediator Rory Olson, good to have you with us. My name is Rushton Hurley. I am uh, part, of, uh, part, of, part of Roger's team that is the committee, uh, committee group uh, for getting programs for our club. And, and John, it's really exciting to hear about some of these things that, that you've got going, especially in that it was inspired by Rotary. So, so one question I have is you're part of the Rotary Club of Pickering. How, how has your club responded to the activities that you've got involved with? Has it been uh, the kind of thing where they're, they're heavily involved, they're generally supportive? What, what kind of things do you have? Actually, uh, my club and also our district is, is heavily involved in, in what we're doing. Uh, and so I've got the full support of, uh, of both. We've actually got a lot of support from different districts right across Canada. And uh, not only that, uh, we were we were presented at Rotary International. We had an opportunity to to you know let people know what we're doing here, and now because colonization didn't just happen here in Canada, it happened in the states, it happened in Australia. We're actually having uh, Rotarians from those districts and areas starting to reach out to us, and and we're sharing what we've learned uh, with them. And uh, wherever we can we can help each other, uh, you know, just makes makes a lot of sense as a Rotarian. But the great thing is here is. You get the student-to-student -student exchange going, and eventually, maybe two and a half, three years down the road, we might be able to expand that, expand that into an exchange between somebody from Canada, an Indigenous person from Canada, and an Aboriginal person in Australia. It's what Rotarians do really, really well. I love it. Um, I got a whole, whole kind of crowd of questions, but I want to make sure, Rory, you get a, a chance to jump in as well. So if you're ready, just unmute and, uh, and, and feel free uh, you know, whenever you're ready on the front. Um, now, when, when we look at the, uh, you know, the idea of the, the conditions they face, right? So, you know, you, we had this thing where 3%, I believe, of, of the young people, there was a certain age range in Canada, are Indigenous. They represent 23% uh, of the unemployed. Do I remember those numbers properly? I think you're right, yeah. Now, to me, that, th that's the kind of thing that you can expect in any environment where, where a group is is challenged by poverty right because poverty essentially means that there are fewer educational opportunities fewer educational opportunities mean that there are fewer opportunities to uh, to you know kind of move up you know socioeconomic status wise uh, and so so when when you think about providing educational opportunities that can help them uh, essentially leapfrog in a, in, in, a, in a process are there entrepreneurial educational pieces to how HIP works. So are, is, is that also a part of how we're thinking about getting people in that community to be able to take advantage of the learning that's happening, not just with the uh, students, but in terms of how they uh, create new possibilities for their own communities? Is there something along those lines? Uh, absolutely, and that's a great question actually, Rushton. Um, so we, we started off with the, the younger kids and, and the high schools. Uh, and soon found ourselves then bridging the gap to get them to post-secondary. But when you speak to some of the, the elders and the chiefs, uh, for example, Chief Friday, uh, he's just a little further up on the James Bay uh, chain. He said to me, John, what would be great is if somebody did come here, it's an isolated community, and help set up a laundromat and, and help run that over the course of a few years, training somebody to eventually take it over and buy it buy it from the people who made the initial investment. So, so there's lots of little projects and opportunities like that. Financial literacy has to be put in place. So that's a component that we're working on. We're actually working with the government of Canada as well, as well as a number of uh, the larger indigenous organizations to be able to bring that to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I, I like the idea that, um, that, that it's recognized at, at various levels of the system, that, that that can be a part of it. So, so let's kind of zero in on, on the, uh, the trip that the, the uh, Moose Cree students will be uh, making to, uh, to your area in December. So 
when that happens, um, first of all, just some of the logistics. How, how many kids are, are going to make the trip? Uh, do they fly from from where they are? You know, just in kind of smaller planes. I mean, how, how does that work? You know, in, in terms of getting the kids back and forth. So let me, I'll do the reverse of that. I'll tell you about the kids actually going north. In order for the kids to go north, they actually drove from Toronto to uh, Cochrane, which is about, uh, you know, an eight hour drive. And then they got on a train, which was another five hours to get to Moosonee. And then they had to cross over because Moose Factory is actually an island. Yeah. So then they had to cross over on uh, a, 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 a boat taxi uh, to get over onto the island and then get to uh, their final destination on Moose Factory. So the kids up there will do the reverse. There is a there is a small uh, uh, airport in Moosonee, and so that is that is a potential that they could fly down. But the cost of flying is extremely expensive. Um, in any of these remote and isolated communities, it's very very costly to be able to fly in and out of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Roy, do you have any comments or questions? Yeah, okay, I'm unmuted, right? Yes, uh, can hear you. Uh, no, I find this to be fascinating. Uh, I will admit, like most people from the United States, my knowledge of Canada is somewhat limited. And if I hadn't listened to Gordon Lightfoot, I'd probably know nothing at all. But uh, no, this sounds like a really great program. Thank you. Thank you. It, you know, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And, and you know, when you're talking about the disconnect, it's, it's because of the isolation. A lot of these communities are very isolated. I mean, we have the social challenges as well uh, mm -hmm. with the racism. Uh, some of the, the smaller communities as, as these Indigenous people are, are moving into some of the larger communities, there's that, that conflict that's happening um, but when you're in an isolated community and you don't have the same opportunities as somebody from an urban center uh, you know that 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 that's a huge disconnect so by the time that these kids are able to actually get to university you want to make sure that we're helping them be competitive and so having the tools having a laptop having the knowledge having just the same similar type of opportunities as other kids will make a huge difference at the end of the day. We were talking earlier too, is that when you go to some of these isolated communities, we'll have a teacher sometimes who's non-Indigenous go into that community, but they won't stay more than two years, if that sometimes. It's a culture change, it's, it's isolation. Um, what we need to do is we need to help get more Indigenous teachers. And, and uh, we're working towards those goals with Indigenous leaders. And when you have the indigenous teachers, you have someone who represents them and a young person can say, hey, I see myself as being successful at the end of the day. Very cool. So I love that in the way you prepare the students for the exchange, uh, not just the, the cultural preparatory pieces, things like this, but you recognize that, that the kids uh, in, in Moose Factory have plenty to teach the kids in Toronto, right? And, and that, that, that means that the kind of relationship they have seems to be on, on, on the kind of equal footing where, where it can succeed, uh, which, which is something I love to see. I'm, I'm particularly curious if they are experiencing things related to climate change, being on, on an island in a river right there at Hudson Bay, right? Are, are they seeing, you know, kind of timing of uh, of, of winter, I anything like that, or related to, you know, the, the fish, the wildlife there, that, that for them becomes part of their story. They certainly are. In fact, that was something that was brought up uh, a number of times. Um, the kids from Toronto had the chance, and, and even myself, you have the chance to meet local people, some who were part of 60 Scoop, some that went to residential school. Uh, these are people who are guides, and these are people who definitely help us understand the culture and, and the environment there. One of the things that they were telling us is that uh, polar bears are coming in closer now into the community, which they never did originally in Moose Factory. But when the polar bears are coming in, they're very scrawny, they're very skinny, and they're very hungry. And so it's creating interesting challenges that way uh, overall with these, the animal movement. And uh, as the ice uh, recedes and as the tree line begins to move, 
uh, they're very in touch with their environment and what's going on inside that environment. It changes hunting patterns. It changes uh, quite, a, quite a few things, including even the water line, which they were really worried about, uh, was on the rise there as well. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the number, the number of discussions that can go from there. And yet we've kind of run through our time, uh, unfortunately. So, so I want to wind things down as we usually do. I'll, I'll do some, some final bits and then I'll hand it back to you for, for final comments before we stop the recording. Uh, to all of you who are watching, uh, thank you very much for taking a little time and being part uh, of our program this week. You are always welcome to join us, the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Our goal is to have messages that, that inspire you to see new possibilities for helping others and to be a part of, of a worldwide effort uh, in Rotary to, to make, uh, make communities better, to help people in ways that, that, that are not only the kind of things that warm your heart, but that excite your imagination as well. Uh, the kinds of innovative possibilities and service are, are stronger now than I would say they ever have been. Uh, if you have been a, a visitor uh, in, in watching this recording, please let us know. So there is a, there is a you know, place where you put in your, your attendance, right? You know, and that, that also, if you do that properly, it'll generate an email that it goes back to you that you can pass along to your club secretary if you were trying to make up a miss. Additionally, get involved in the discussion. Uh, in the discuss, D-I-S-Q-U-S, section below, you'll find the opportunity to leave a comment. What kinds of things uh, did this program and did other pieces of our meeting make you think? And, and feel free to respond to other people's comments as well. Our goal is to have the kinds of discussions that, uh, that civil dis discourse makes possible, and that's in a too short a supply everywhere else, so let's, let's do it here. Uh, before we finish, I'd like to hand back to our speaker, John. Uh, and, and give you the chance to make the last comments. But thank you again for taking your time to be a part of this with us. Well, thank you uh, for allowing me to, uh, to participate and to tell our story. Um, obviously, this pilot, we're just in the middle of it. And if anybody is interested in following it all the way through, you no, know, please reach out to me or, or follow us on our website, www.rotaryhip.com. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm available by phone or by email to have further discussions with anybody. So, but listen, thank you so much for allowing me to tell the story. Absolutely. And to all of our viewers, as, as always, you can see below the, the screen where this, uh, this program is on our, our meeting, uh, ways to learn more about the content of our program. We'll see you next week.